Hi, everyone. Welcome to From Boring to High Scoring, creating playful learning experiences with game-based learning and gamification, brought to you by the ACRL UL University of Library Section's Professional Development Committee. That was a mouthful. Um, we're so delighted to have you and our presenters, Amber and Danielle, here with us today. I am Anna Sandelli, co-chair of the ACRL ULS Professional Development Committee, and I'll be moderating this program along with my co-chair, Colleen Quinn, and our fellow committee member, Alicia Vandering. This is one of an ongoing series of programs sponsored by our committee, and I'll go ahead and put a link to those um, in our chat. Before we get started, just a few logistical items to share. This session is being recorded and we'll send a video or we'll send a link of the video slides and any other supplemental documentation to everyone who's registered. We are not able to share the trans chat transcript, but we are um, going to share any links to questions that we receive in the chat along with the recording. The program will run for an hour total with time for questions. And if you have questions, please feel free, free to put them in the chat throughout the presentation and Colleen and Alicia will be collecting them. Um, at the end, we'll post a link to a brief evaluation, and we would love it if you could just take a few minutes to share your feedback with us. With those announcements out of the way, I'm very happy to introduce today's program, From Boring to High Scoring, Creating Playful Learning Experiences with Game-Based Learning and Gamification. I'll briefly introduce our two presenters and then turn it over to them to more fully introduce themselves and share their slides. Um, we have Amber Sewell. Amber is a teaching and learning librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And we have Danielle Costello. Danielle is an academic librarian at the University of Georgia. And without further delay, I'll turn it over to Amber and Danielle. Thank you. All right. Everybody got the screen sharing well? Ooh. And we will go ahead and get started. And so hi, everybody. Uh, like Anna said, uh, we are your presenters for today. I'm Amber Sewell. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a teaching and learning librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where I work primarily with first and second year undergraduate students. Um, I'm also the incoming president elect of the Games and Gaming Roundtable for ALA. And thank you so much for introducing me as well. I'm Danielle Costello. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a librarian at the University of Georgia, where I primarily teach library instruction and develop programming for the student body. I am the president uh, for the uh, ALA's Gaming and Gaming Roundtable for the 2024-2025 year, uh, where I also serve on both the events programming and outreach committees. Um, and since this is a presentation about games and play, we hope you'll join us in a small one we've uh, made for you. Just keep an eye out for uh, both of our pictures and keep track of how many you see of each. And let's get started into the uh, intros. All right, so just to briefly go over what Danielle and I are going to talk about today, we're going to do a very quick intro to game-based learning and gamification um, that will then help us talk about when to use which approach. Uh, Danielle and I will share examples uh, of how we've used these in our own work, and then we'll dive a little bit into backward design and why this is an essential piece of creating playful learning experiences for instruction. Uh, we will share final thoughts, uh, both Danielle and I will share them, but also we've created space for you guys. Um, and then we will end with a ton of resources that you can use uh, if you want to explore this further. And so to start, uh, we'd really like to explore kind of what you all think of when you hear the words gamification. So we have created a uh, Slido. Uh, all you have to do is either go to your, um, use your mobile device and use the QR code or go to slido.com and put in that uh, room number and just give us what comes to mind when you think of the word gamification. And we're gonna give a little bit of time, a couple minutes for this one. I'm very excited to see what y'all have. <laughs> yes, yes, the participants are coming in. Oh, Kahoot is an excellent one. I've used that before. Fun, yes. Uh, creating games out of things, learning fun, achievements. Marketing, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> feel that so much sometimes. It's, while fun for our patrons and students, sometimes it's less fun for us and a lot of work. 
play can be very serious indeed. Oh, and thank you so much, everyone, for putting in your ideas. I'm seeing a lot of different ways we can use gamification and ways we understand gamification. So um, stick with us. We're going to have one more question before we roll into things. And we're going to show these uh, word clouds for everyone afterwards so you can kind of have them for later. And so what comes to mind when you think of the phrase game-based learning, whether that's something similar to gamification or something completely different, type in those as well. Interactive, board games. Yes, I'm a big fan of board games. Serious and educational play. Still with the ideas of engagement and active participation and motivation. Um, we have a couple more pedagogical leaning thoughts on this, but also a lot of overlap as well. Oh, excellent. Thank you all so much for participating. So the reason we did that, and then the reason we're going to um, do definitions next, is because sometimes when you say gamification, you mean game-based learning and vice versa. And while they're very similar concepts, they are there are some divisions between them. And we'll, I'll let Amber go into those. Yeah, so I remember when I was getting uh, my education degree, uh, the only instructor who talked about gamification, she had real big feelings about it. Um, and that was often because gamification and game-based learning are used interchangeably. Um, and while I'm not a stickler for definitions, it can be good to have at least a foundational understanding of the differences between these terms before we dive in. Um, so gamification is essentially where you have a lesson plan or an activity and you add a game mechanic or two onto it to make it a little more motivating or engaging. So if you've got an activity and you decide, eh, I'm going to add points in a leaderboard or I'm going to add a timer to this, um, that is gamification. The lesson plan can be separated from those game mechanics very easily and still stand as a learning experience. Whereas with game-based learning, this is really a little more intensive. This is starting from the ground up, starting from scratch. You take your learning objectives and you build the entire experience around it. So this way, the learning content in the game cannot be separated out because game mechanics have been chosen to intentionally like take advantage of the affordances of games to facilitate learning. Um, and that's the most essential difference. Um, we also included play because especially in library instruction, a one-shot session, um, you don't need a full game to create that low stakes, fun learning environment where failure is not only okay, but is actually expected. When we play, we don't expect everything to go exactly right. And that can be a really fun environment to replicate for learning. I did see somebody on our word cloud mention series play, um, which is an entirely different category um, that, at least my understanding, is it's a lot of professional development as games, a lot of training as games, um, which we won't get into as much today, but is, again, a separate category from all of these. And so... We just, I love icons. I love kind of simplifying things. And so to put it more simply, um, if you think of gamification, that's you have your object and like Legos, just kind of stick on your game-based fun to those. You don't really mess with the actual item that you start with. Uh, for game-based learning, you have a whole lot of things. You have your objectives, you have your lesson, you have your event, and then you have game shenaniganry and you mush them all together and you create something very new that stands by itself and is a combination of all your elements. And then with play, it's really experiential. It surrounds the object. It gives you more of a uh, feeling of engagement and novelty to enhance what you're doing. So there's a little bit visual for y'all. And now when to use which approach? Because this is important because sometimes it's better to do game-based learning, sometimes it's better to use gamification. We have kind of four areas to consider when deciding what to do with which. So one of the first things to start with when you're trying to decide which one to implement in your own learning environment is how much control you have over the lesson plan. Um, how much are you able to affect or change? Um, for instance, where I work, um, I am a part of a teaching team that works with our English 102 composition courses, but our department comes up with a kind of standard lesson plan that we can tweak to some degree, um, but it's not like I'm going to use game-based learning here, completely tear down the lesson that we've all agreed upon and build something new, because we want all of our students to have essentially the same experience across instructors. 
Um, so that's probably going to be something, and I'll talk about an example later, where I'm going to use play or maybe bring in some gamification elements. Um, I am also coordinator to one of our first year seminars for exploring majors. That one I'm the coordinator for. Um, and so that one I was able to kind of sit together with the coordinator of that program, determine some learning outcomes together, and I was able to build from the ground up from scratch a game-based learning experience. And the next thing you have to consider is time. Like it is important to figure out how long you have to make and implement whatever it is you're trying to do. And really it can take a long time to create a game. That's putting, create, figuring out your learning objectives, storyboarding, designing, implementation, and beyond that, you know, the actual having the event, having the experience, and then play testing beforehand also can be a lot to consider. So if a project needs doing soon, you might want to consider adding elements of play through either gamification or playful experiences rather than speed running the whole game-based learning kind of uh, experience. Another common uh, thing that comes up when you're talking about gaming in higher education or games in academic libraries is buy-in with administration. Um, when you are considering which approach to implement, knowing how your supervisor or their supervisors feel about experimentation and change, kind of trying out new things can be really important. Um, if you've got an, an ad administration that is like, yes, go play, have fun, um, you can start with game-based learning and feel supported that even if it doesn't go exactly as planned, that that's not going to come around and bite you. Um, whereas if you have more reluctant uh, supervisors or administration, maybe you want to start small. Um, you want to start with using some elements of play or some elements of gamification. Maybe you want to start it in an outreach environment and then bring that into the classroom. Um, of course, there are other strategies. I feel like Danielle and I could give a whole presentation on how to convince reluctant administration to buy into implementing games in libraries. Um, but another strategy is considering, are there people you can partner with who could contribute to the success of this? So um, is that partnering with another faculty member in a different department who's also interested in implementing games in the classroom? And so that gives you a little bit of extra support. And really considering your whole community, not just administration or partners, is really important when you're deciding what you want to create and what you are creating. Because experience levels vary widely within your student populations, within your patron groups. You might have a population that's well-versed in a particular type of game, maybe TTRPGs or esports or trivia or escape rooms, but not the others. So it might be good to survey your population to figure out what they like, what they enjoy, and start with small experiences and work your way up. You might need to guardrail those experiences so create kind of mini events or mini um, asynchronous kinds of play before you have a big main event or you can maybe try doing more thorough rules and more thorough explanations it's really about localizing to the needs of your community and going back to partners and campus uh really gameplay fits into a lot of new directions that the academy is trying to go into whether that's experiential learning active learning peer-to-peer -peer learning games are might really be a great avenue that hasn't been considered yet so definitely go figure out the vibe of your campus figure out what they want to get into and see how you can bring games and swing that into as well and surely there's going to be more partners for you to be able to find and explore these ideas with So now let's do some examples before we get into the nuts and bolts of things. Um, and we have examples for each gamification, game-based learning and play. And I'll start us off with um, assessment trivia. This was a gamification um, process where I had a library instruction workshop for a biology lab cohort. And we already had the instructor set with what she wanted us to teach and what she wanted to go over, but she also wanted to do assessment and she also wanted to explore some ideas of gamification. So we figured best thing to do, trivia, easy peasy. and it can be added to the end of the session versus having to kind of take place in the middle or move things around. And also gave kind of the onerous task of assessment a much more fun spin. The students like competing against each other and also served to reinforce the lesson that they just did. So it was really, what kind of things did you learn today? Who are your librarians? Do you actually remember my name? That kind of thing. So it was a really easy way to see both assess the students, but give them a little bit more, more chance to get back into the lesson. 
Um, my example of gamification is kind of a standard for a one shot. Um, we used to have an activity where we wanted students to be able to navigate in a database and use some of the functions. So can they sort by relevance? Can they adjust their search? Do they know how to find a permalink? Um, and so that can be an activity where people either don't participate or maybe take a little bit longer, don't get to all the tasks. And so that's something that you can add a timer and points to. And so you get points for how however many tasks you successfully complete within a short period of time. And that's just a really quick example of how to throw on just like two simple game mechanics um, to gamify a regular class activity. And then my big game-based learning experience is always a welcome week escape room. It was an extravaganza of learning objectives from letting them understand who their librarian is, their subject specialist is, what the different resources and different services the library had to offer to the students. And we took each learning objective, connected it to a particular puzzle, created a larger meta puzzle that they had to solve around all of that, and really created a true escape room virtually. Um, but made sure to point out all the things we wanted them to know about the library and their um, introductory experience to um, the campus. Next, I kind of talked a little bit about um, game-based learning that I did for my first year seminar. Um, this one, we wanted to create something for students that was built around an existing assignment, uh, which is students had to uh, argue about which major was the best. And so it was this really pitched fun activity that they do as a class. Um, and so I decided to create a game um, where they would then argue about the authority of the sources they were using for this assignment. So as they were exploring which major is the best, um, I wanted them to be able to a find authoritative sources for that information need, um, but then also to pick apart their opposing team's arguments like, oh, you asked your advisor about the work-life balance of this major? They don't do it. How well do they know this profession? Um, and so that one was a lot of fun. And then for my last uh, example of this one, a playful experience, uh, we created a lecture series called TTRPG and Academy, where we uh, explored the intersection of a field of study and then a role playing game. So uh, history and Call of Cthulhu was our first um, example that we did. And it's really so that the students could understand how academic research could bring depth and texture to their game experiences. And the reason we did this was because our regular lecture series were getting zero attendance. And so we wanted to have something lighter and more fun to draw students, but still kind of connect them to resources and people that they would need throughout their time here um, at the university. And it had a benefit of helping them break down information silos so they could use the information they learned in class for a wide variety of places like their games, and then explore transferable skills where they could use the research um, that they did for their campaigns and characters and understand that is real research and you can use those skills for um, your papers or your presentations as well. And then my last example is uh, again situated in that English composition course that I was referring to. Um, can't change the lesson plan. It's a great lesson plan. Um, but a way that I brought play into it was that I noticed students were having a really hard time putting search strings into practice. I would talk about how important it is to construct your search strings, use those appropriate Boolean operators. Um, and then as I walked around, students, it, it wasn't connecting. Um, so I decided to teach creating a search string combo as playing Super Smash Brothers. Um, and so that's actually been really effective. I have noticed a marked improvement in the search string students are using. And I think it's just because this like moment of play, we go from maybe a little more of a traditional active learning environment to uh, something where they're, maybe the students who aren't paying attention all of a sudden look to the front of the room and it's just the character menu uh, from <laughs> Super Smash Brothers and they're like, wait, what's happening? Um, so like the students aren't doing any activity other than helping me break down a research question and turn it into search strings. Um, but it is a little bit of play that happens there. Um, and I see some people are asking questions about pictures. So I'm gonna move the next slide and then we can take a pause for some of the questions that have come through. Uh, but here's some kind of visual representations of our examples. Uh, at the top center here, you can see that is the slide that I use um, to introduce the search string activity. 
that's all that's there. And then I go to the back of the board and we actually take a student's research question and break it down and create a couple of different search strings. Um, down at the bottom, right under that, is a choose-your-own-adventure game that I created. This was an example of game-based learning, where I started with learning outcomes of orienting students to the libraries. This was made for fall 2020, um, so things looked very different. Um, so those were the learning outcomes, and I built this entire choose-your-own-adventure game around it. And then just to the left of that is the five-minute breakout box. Um, this was something that I used early on in my game experience as a librarian, um, where maybe I didn't have the confidence to create a full lesson plan. So the five minute breakout box was my first time creating a game based around learning outcomes and testing it in a like very chill outreach environment. And I'll let Danielle share about hers as yeah. well. And so in the upper left is um, one of my TTRPG experiences called The Tavern, and really it was about meeting your librarian, but in the setting of we're going to talk about TTRPGs and slowly intersect research and, oh, there's a libguide for that, or you know there's a lot of different books in the catalog that can help you with that. So again, kind of a playful learning experience. In the upper right is my... Um, relax on the go. It's my way of getting students to de-stress, but also not throw away my events flyers. So um, in the bottom corner, very tiny, you can see all the events. And then on the other corner, you can see the resources. So this got th tossed into the recycle and trash much less often. And then I was able to uh, QR code to the um, answers. And so I could know that students were using it and engaging with it. And also the latest thing that I've done um, in game-based kind of shenaniganry is Taylor Swift or Shakespeare, where we had a trivia event where you just figured out, is it Taylor Swift or Shakespeare? And again, a de-stress experience, but also kind of directed towards our English cohort to give them a chance to connect with each other and play and be in uh, space with each other. So you can see we have tons of examples from analog to digital, live to asynchronous, single events to combined events. And really, we're going to open the space up also for you to talk to us about what you've done. So we have another slide, Go. Well, I was actually going to pause. I've oh. seen several questions come through about oh. Uh, some of the stuff here. absolutely um so i will go ahead and start with one i saw about the timer question example that i used for gamification um and how to work with students who may be time-based accommodations is one that they have for classrooms um Danielle and I talk about the importance of accessibility in designing games. I think this is a major part of implementing games in your classroom. Um, I personally, anytime I work with a class, one of the things I do in an introductory email is ask student or ask instructors if any of their students have formal or informal accommodations they require. That way I can adjust any activities ahead of time. So in that instance, I wouldn't use that game mechanic. I would find some other way to introduce gamification or play in it. Um, Danielle, do you have any thoughts or we can pause oh, for another question? I did have, um, so I did notice a question that uh, asked about um, detailed examples. We do have in our resource, um, our full examples of things like how to do virtual escape rooms, all my resource docs for building several different kinds of play experiences. And then I had one question that I saw that was also about uh, the Call of Cthulhu event, which was uh, the RPG in academia. And really the learning objective for that was to meet librarians, meet the, um, you're in, uh, in a less formal setting, meet professors um, and get a chance to be kind of in space and talk with those um, um, instructors, but also really to understand that learning happens across the board. The learning you do for play can also be the learning you do for research and vice versa. Um, yeah, any other questions do you think? Um, just real quick, I made the choose your own adventure game in Twine. Um, let's see, everything else, like Danielle said, for all of the stuff people are asking for examples of, um, we will have those available. I think. How can we access the resources we just mentioned? They will be in the slide, which our moderators are sharing um, links as we go. So they will be, we've got them all in our slides. All right. So I guess we can move on to our next word cloud. Absolutely. So now <laughs> uh, we would like to know what have you all done with play and its construction? Because it's always fun to be able to get ideas and to see what every other university, every other library is doing and exploring as well. So again, go to slide 
www.dough.com. There's the uh, room code or there's the QR up in the uh, top left. And we'll share these word clouds as well when we get a chance. So Jeopardy. Oh, Jeopardy is wonderful and amazing. Everybody loves Jeopardy. Trivia, scavenger hunts. Scavenger hunts are excellent. And don't worry if you haven't done any before now. 100% will hopefully by the end of this be able to help get you there where you want to go with play. Dungeons and Dragons, scavenger hunts. And we made hunts. an RPG for evaluating sources. Now I want to see it. Oh, that's so cool. Murder mystery, trivia. Oh, thank you guys so much for sharing. We will take these and we will share widely with everyone at the end as well. Yeah, we're all over the place. This is great. So let's roll into our next slide, I think. Yep. And actually go into the nuts and bolts of it. So I wanted to talk about backward designing game-based learning because this is something I feel very strongly about. Um, and if you all are people who are interested in designing your own games, for instructional purposes, or maybe you've already done it, uh, backward design is kind of an essential place to start. And I will say this is a very truncated view of the backward design process. On the resources slide, there is a worksheet that I developed that walks you through like step by step how to go through this process. I think there's like 17 to 20 steps. Um, so we're just doing a very brief overview because again, this could be a whole other course, uh, but just to hit the highlights, um, the first and most important thing about backward design with game-based learning is starting with your learning objectives. Um, you really need to know the why, and this is important for several reasons. Um, one is alignment. Uh, this Knowing your learning objectives up front um, is an important first step to make sure the game actually serves its purpose. I think a lot of times when I come up against people who are have negative experiences with games in higher education, it's because the why was either not evident through the design of the game, maybe it wasn't communicated to the students or the learners why they were doing this game, and by playing it, they couldn't tell exactly why they were doing it, um, or the designer got distracted through the design process and kind of drifted away from the learning objectives. Um, it is really easy to get distracted by like a cool game format, your inspiration, um, a new tool that you're learning, and sometimes kind of stray away from the learning objectives because you want to try out some new features or you're teaching yourself coding and you're like really into that. So starting with your learning objectives and just touching base with them at each step is a great way to make sure that your game is in alignment. Um, the second thing this does is it makes your game accessible. And this can be really important, especially when you have those more reluctant stakeholders. If you start with your learning objectives and you build in an intention to assess it from the beginning, even if it's just, did my learners have fun? Um, Starting with your learning objectives is going to make that a lot easier. Um, and then lastly, keep it brief. Most games should only have one to three learning outcomes. More than that, it's just very ambitious. Um, and especially if it's your first time or two designing games for learning, um, even if it's just did my learners have fun and learn a little bit about the library, um, those are perfectly wonderful learning objectives for games in academic libraries. So now we have mechanics. This is the how after the why. Uh, so these are things like worker placement, turn order, role play, hidden object, bingo, and so forth. These are the building blocks and elements that make up a game, and they're what define the play experience. Now, thankfully, you don't have to come up with all these on your own. There is a company called Board Game Geek with ha that has lists of a variety of different descriptions and examples of different mechanics, some of which I've added to this word cloud, but there's so much more um, on that link. But also, you can look through uh, modern board games, card games, and video games. Much like being an avid reader helps you become a better writer, becoming a uh, playing lots of different games helps you become a better designer. By playing games, you get to explore those different mechanics. You get a feel for what is interesting and has potential for use in instruction, outreach, events, all those kinds of things. And when in doubt, don't overcomplicate it. In fact, sometimes simpler is better, and you can use childhood classics like Simon Says, or um, for uh, my particular example on the right, Veracity, I, along with my colleagues, Rebecca Strana and Russell Brandon, created a tabletop role-playing game called Veracity based on the classic uh, Two Truths and a Lie style game. And our idea was to explore media literacy concepts by having a member role-play as a, pe a person from the media, whether that was an influencer or an anchorman or a reporter, and have the audience figure out what information was presented as truth and what was just bunky. 
So there's a lot of different places you can draw inspiration from, but we also have a slide exactly on that. Yeah, so I mentioned with the learning objectives to not get too distracted. And I think one of the things that I worry about when I talk about game-based learning is the idea that like by saying you start from scratch, that means you literally have to create something new every time, which is absolutely not the case. Um, there are so many great games out there. And the fun thing about being somebody who wants to use games in your work, you probably enjoy oh, I'm seeing all the game changer love come through the chat. This is making me so happy. Um, you probably play games outside of work. Um, so for instance, Game Changer, Danielle and I both get a lot of inspiration from there, both um, as a way to demonstrate really essential elements of what makes play and games a thing, um, but also just the format. So I'm actually running Game Changer in the library for a first year orientation week in the fall. I'm so excited about it. Um, Super Fight is another one of my absolutely favorite games. I have been playing it for years and have just kept it in the back of my mind as like one day I'm going to do a work activity about this. And that's actually the inspiration for Authority Argle Bargle was it was finally like that's an arguing game. I wanted students to argue. Um, and so it finally married together. Yeah. And really take advantage of the game designers creating and exploring interesting concepts because they're doing the work for you already you can take and grab wholesale to use for what you want um for example on the right daybreak is a game about climate change the designers are tackling a very serious concept but in making it engaging and interactive for their players uh, level design is fantastic for understanding how to scaffold and make learning intuitive and memorable and of course don't forget ala has your back because we have both the programming librarians and games and gaming roundtable putting out resources creating different play experiences so that way you can take it back from there to your own home libraries. So the next step, once you've kind of figured out what your game is going to be, what it's going to look like, is storyboarding and creating your timeline. And this is often the piece where um, I see faculty members bulk is, is talking about storyboarding. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I started as a movie nerd from a very young age. So when I think of storyboarding, I think of like those frames they would have of like, this is what the movie is going to look like at every single piece. I cannot draw. Um, but I've got here examples of a storyboard that I created for that virtual choose your own library adventure. Um, the very first thing students would have to do is decide if they wanted to engage with the library virtually or if they wanted to come into the physical building, which is called Hodges. Um, and so this is the storyboard that I created for that game. And essentially the purpose of a storyboard is to map out the player's experience. Um, and so this serves a couple of purposes. One, you can see like, does this make sense for the player? Have I missed any steps? Um, it's also a good place for content check. Like you can see here, I've got like little cues done at the bottom. It's probably helpful for students to know how to request a research consultation in fall of 2020, because that looks very different. Um, so it's a good place for you to make sure that this makes sense for the player. Um, it's a good way for you as the designer to make sure you haven't missed anything. This is also the stage to hand it to colleagues for feedback. Um, this is a great place that other people should be able to look at it and get a sense of what you're going for, even without any like illustrations or graphics. Um, at this point, it's really low fidelity, so it's not a problem if your colleague is like, I don't understand how you got from step A to B. Um, there are five different steps in there that are in your brain, but a new student is not going to know them. Um, so this is a really essential point to get feedback as well. Um, and then creating your timeline. Uh, I think making games takes a lot longer than I've ever budgeted for it. Um, so this is a good place to pause and figure out, is it just you or are you going to be able to bring other people onto your team? How much time should you allot for this process? Um, and then once you've done that, it's time to build the thing. Um, you take your storyboard and you make it real. Um, and, you know, this could look like any number of things. So we didn't dive too deeply into it. 
um, but Danielle? Yeah, I think this was the hardest slide to articulate because honestly, it does look so very different if you're making a skate game versus a trivia game versus a TTRPG. So we went very light, although we have resources that go very deeply into particular types of games. But really, our advice for this step is don't be afraid to play and experiment and really take good ideas from outside and bring them back to your own. And you don't have to break down or pull out every mechanic or ele every element you want. You can wholesale adapt a game and all of its mechanics and insert your objectives and content there. Uh, but also, this is the place where you want to write the exact rules and the exact examples of how to play. I cannot stress enough that that is the hardest part in my experience is writing a rule and explaining what you want people to do. Um, definitely take some time here to make sure you kind of write out exactly how you want that experience to go from your storyboard and flesh everything out with your, you know, themes and pre pretty pictures and kind of go high fidelity at this point. And then once you have your beautiful, created baby project, wonderful thing, uh, the next step I highly, highly recommend is play test, play test, play test. You know all the ins and outs of your game. Your patrons do not. You are asking something novel, something unique of them. And really, play test is how we kind of work the kinks out of that. It's if you play test with the group that you want to um, explore with, so grab some student assistants and say, hey, will you play this trivia? Will you play this game? You can figure out if it's something they'd be interested in, excited in. It's also a place where um, if you send it out to your colleagues and, uh, again, still localized, the people that you might want to play with, uh, it helps you understand if you actually have communicated those rules properly or if there is something inherently important missing. And it also helps you anticipate where things go wrong, what's broken, what you might have missed, whether that's a broken link, whether that's you misspelled something in your puzzle and now it's all bunky because your cipher is completely off. Playtesting helps you figure out where your game could be broken. And it also helps you figure out what group or what population you have missed. Because with playtest, if you get enough experiences and you get enough perspective, that helps you anticipate whether you've missed an accessibility kind of feature. So, for example, if you create a puzzle and it the most important features are it's red and green, and you haven't playtested with somebody that's colorblind, you might have missed something very, very critical. So, playtesting is here to make sure you hit those universal design kind of features and make sure that you're giving an experience that everybody can enjoy. Please just break your game. Break it right here at this stage before your players do. And then you have several emails of, I'm very confused. What's going on? So one of the last steps is evaluation and iteration. Um, and we say one of the last steps because you could iterate on a game forever, as Danielle will talk about in a minute. Um, one really quick example is Authority Argo Bargle. Um, I played it for the first time last fall. And you can see here the instructions, the top one, um, just to arrange into their teams, choose a spokesperson for their team, and then they would come up when it was time to argue. Um, and I got some really good feedback from instructors and participants. Um, we saw that by electing just one spokesperson, often it was just the spokesperson and maybe one other person working on constructing the argument together. Um, and also the spokesperson felt a lot of pressure to get up in front of the class and talk in front of everybody, which was a thing that I had, I knew would be a concern when I designed the game. Um, and I went, decided to go ahead with it because this was helping them practice for having to do this in their final exam. So I felt like we created a very chill, low stakes. They were literally up there for less than a minute, um, but it was still a little uncomfortable for some of our students. So the next picture under that you can see are some modifications that I made to the next iteration we taught this spring. So we can he see here teams this time got a slide. And so this slide had some prompts for them to fill in to encourage every member of the team to take a bullet point and add something. Um, and then we had the entire team come to the front to speak. Um, it was highly encouraged that each person should speak, um, but even in teams where only one person was willing to actually verbalize, um, they at least were standing up there with the rest of their team and they had their slide behind them to kind of reference. And so this was just a small iteration that we made based on the feedback um, that we were able to observe. And I think it uh, made a big difference. It's always nice to be able to use what you have taken and keep on rolling with that. I think my best example is I've been doing escape rooms and break-in boxes, breakout boxes for a long time. So I started 
in 2020 with a break um, breakout box, which is essentially an escape room in reverse. And it was very simple. All it was was puzzles to connect the students to various um, uh, resources, uh, game resources in our catalog. And from there, I rolled out um, kind of my use my puzzle making experience and created a digital virtual uh, virtual escape room for um, uh, LSU in 2020. Uh, one where we were able to that was the experience where we connected a lot of learning objectives um, that we wanted the students to know to a variety of puzzles and we made a meta puzzle from that i uh, told that experience to my roundtable coordinator and she decided this was a perfect thing to do for LibLearnX virtual and so for that we made it bigger because we had more um, learning objectives we wanted to hit so we did th multiple days of different escape room experiences. And we created a meta puzzle of a meta puzzle, which was a brilliant, terrifying, wonderful experience. And then we made it even bigger because one, everybody really enjoyed it, but two, they didn't like having to kind of cycle through each day and be on schedule because everybody was at conference. So schedules are kind of weird and mismatched. So instead we made it kind of an asynchronous experience where we had three zones, uh, uh, forest zone, volcano zone, beach zone, and you can go between all those different escape places and eventually the final meta puzzle would link everything together and that be played on people's own time. And then we took all the feedback from the uh, committee creating that and we scaled it way, way, way down uh, to just a hybrid uh, single page uh, logic grid for uh, annual last year. And so you can shrink and grow and make things physical, make things virtual, go back and forth, use all the things that you've learned to keep reiterating, keep rolling into different play experiences. All right, this is excellent time. I was just making a note about this. Uh, time for some final thoughts. Um, and we really want to encourage you all to share as well. Um, I've been seeing a lot of stuff in chat, people sharing resources or asking for brainstorming. So we did set up a Padlet and this will be available after today. I'm sure after this presentation, Danielle and I will go in and add our own comments. Um, but if you'll join me here at the Padlet, um, this is just a place we've set up to share ideas. Um, so you will see uh, that there is a column for us talking about how you'd like to implement games in your work, what resources would be most helpful for learning more, um, what resources have you found that you think other people would enjoy, um, and then lastly, we have a column on thoughts of a community of practice. Um, I know one of the things I've discover, discovered as, as a librarian who does games is sometimes you're the only one at your institution. Um, and so there's really, it's hard to find people to brainstorm with. Um, so we have thoughts about the community of practice. Um, now that the link is in the Padlet, I will hop over and share that screen so we can comment on all the cool stuff you all are sharing. Right. So people would like to use it to make information literacy sessions more engaging. Oh, I love the idea of playing games that you're not already playing. That's, yes, there's so many different varieties and you could very easily get sucked into just playing TTRPGs. Uh, I know from experience, so <laughs> always good to experiment. Somebody wants to include in first year experience programs. That's one of my favorite places to mm -hmm. do games. I... That's, I think, honestly, where I do most of my gaming is with first year experience programs. Uh, and I love it. Always. Like you get them in with Jeopardy, get them in with trivia, and then they're a cohort and they know somebody. And it's wonderful to see them start exchanging information, building those kind of community bonds. Love it, love it, love it. There is an article about gaming and special collections on our resources list. Um, so definitely check that out. Yeah. Thank you all for adding to this. And we're going to just leave this up here and roll for it for as long as y'all want to be in community with us. So I figure we will go over our last couple of slides and then open it up for questions. We can always come back to the Padlet um, if that is of interest. Like I said, that will stay active for a while because I know Al will want to go through after this presentation. So to start off with our resources, one of the best resources we can ever have is each other. So we are, after this presentation, going to try and create a community of practice where we share um, ideas about games and playful learning and things that we've created and research and theory and really bounce ideas, play, share, think, grow, experience, all those kinds of good things. So uh, if you want, if that sounds cool and interesting to y'all, 100% hit that link. 
uh, get that QR code and we will um, hopefully we're going to take some time. G uh, June's going to be nonsense because of annual, but we'll definitely want to talk in May about when we can start meeting and all that good stuff. As well as the books we've used and highlighted. And then what else do we have? Got articles I know after this. And this is going to, um, this is being linked theoretically in chat uh, by our wonderful, wonderful mod crew. So that way you can get to all these slides and all these links. And there are tons more books and articles. These are just some just ones we found for today. An amuse bouche, if you will. Um, we also have additional resources here. We have the Games and Gaming Roundtable, Discord, and Facebook group. You do not have to be a paying member of GameRT to join these. Um, we said finding other people. This is a great mix of librarians who work with games. Um, so it's a fabulous place to get new ideas, brainstorm. Um, we also have our YouTube channel. Um, GameRT does a ton of programming about how to use games in different library settings. Um, here is that worksheet I mentioned where if you were interested in designing games with game-based learning, it takes you step by step. There are a lot of resources. There's a whole section on like accessibility considerations and resources, different ways to storyboard. Um, We've got a recording of a panel we did about how to create a virtual mystery hunt for your own library. And then, Danielle, do you want to say anything about your beautiful resource doc? Yes. So I love uh, gathering resources. My favorite thing in the entire world is a libguide, is a list. So I put together all the things I use when building mystery room, uh, mystery murder parties, escape rooms, and TTRPG games. So please feel free to use those widely and uh, make your own. And we have so many upcoming shenanigans to explore. So GameRT is always um, having events about um, play and play experiences and how you can have them in your own library. I put the calendars as well as all the things we are doing for annual. We are going to um, have the ALA play experience where we will showcase um, a variety of different games and uh, have our game uh, publishers there to showcase their games as well. But then we're going to talk about how to use games to engage patrons, how to connect and build community through play, as well as how to build a queer community and space through games. So those are our three major things. But also, we're going to be there in our booth. Um, don't know if it's on the map yet, but it will be there. <laughs> um, and we will be there uh, ready to play and experience and tell you all kinds of things that we can, uh, whatever questions you might have to ask. Um, also, if any of you are going to the California Conference for Library Instruction, I will be there at the end of next month doing a workshop on game-based learning and gamification. So essentially, well, today was an introduction and an overview of this beautiful world. Um, in the workshop, we're actually going to take 75 minutes and start planning uh, a playful learning experience. And thank you all for being part of this playful learning experience. We made just a tiny one. So our learning objective for this one was fun and slide engagement. So wanted you to have your eyes on the slide. If you've got 13, 12, or 25 total, you got your, your winners. Thank you so very much for playing. <laughs> Uh, the mechanic was spotting and hidden objects, and the inspiration was kind of uh, those Where is Waldo, I Spy games, as well as Spot It. And this is how easy you can add play and playful experiences and games to any kind of thing you want to do. So thank you all so very much for joining us, and we're going to take questions, I believe, now. We wanted to leave you on some beautiful words. The best way to begin is by beginning. So we hope you go forth and game, um, and we are happy to answer any questions you all have. Thank you, Kelly. A delight, y'all. Thank you, Amber and Danielle. That was fantastic. And I hope you're seeing all of the love and appreciation in the chat. Um, I think you've answered a number of the questions that came up earlier. Um, Colleen, are there any that stand out to you? Colleen and Alicia as the next one? Sure, let's take a look. I'm going to kind of glance through. We have a lot of questions that kind of came in at the beginning too, with the um, different examples you were giving. So there were some questions with when you offer TTRPGs in academia as events with the constraint of one GM per six players. Can you think of any way to scale this other than enlisting other librarians and students? 
I do teach the teacher model, but for students. So I don't, I don't, um, except for teaching character creation, I also um, will do um, how to D DM school essentially. So the more DMs I can create, the less problems I have to deal with as a, a game master because there is always a want for people to have a game master in play. So being able to create that in your own community is very, very helpful. And there's always a ton of students wanting to know more about that, even though they might be shy to be a dungeon master. If you kind of walk them through the steps and help them, then they, you know, they get into that. And a follow-up question was, what software did you use for this game? Uh, which, no, that might be an Amber question. I think that was about the choose your own adventure and that was twine which is one of my favorite uh, platforms to build in and then i did see there was some interest for um sharing the lesson plan for your super smash st search strings um, if that's something you're interested in sharing with us so we can share that out with everyone i would have to type it up um, because it is very straightforward but i can definitely do that <laughs> Um, so another question kind of came in for, it might've been a little bit more for the general chat too, but what are people using for trivia games other than Kahoot now that free Kahoot limits numbers of players? I think most of my trivia is just on Canva or Google Slides. I don't actually use extra technology when I'm using them. Although Kahoot is the kind of major platform. And so understandable that it's, it's hard when it is uh, paywalled. Yeah, and in instruction setting, I usually go Slido because it integrates with Google Slides. Um, is it the prettiest version? No, um, but it's what I use. Sometimes the play experience doesn't need to be pretty. It's just yeah. fun when you're engaging. Um, we had another question was asking for any pointers or suggestions for those who have tried to use Canvas or their LMS for games or game-based learning? I have done a very brief, uh, <laughs> like testing out of using games in Canvas. Um, it's actually not a platform that I use a ton in my role. Um, so I haven't investigated it that deeply or succeeded. However, if you would like to put that question in the uh, Padlet, I'm hoping that there are more librarians that have used that to be able to help you. Unfortunately, I'm mostly analog as well, so I don't even know the words. <laughs> um, we had another question, too, about any suggestions for getting buy-in from higher-ups that are concerned about not appearing, quote, professional? Easy peasy. This is where my brain lives in all time. So <laughs> you start with your mission, whether that's the campus mission, whether that's the library mission, and then you see all those places where it says um, student success or uh, mental health, wellness, Foster all those community sense of belonging, mm -hmm, connecting to the library, to the student, all those things, you grab those and you attach. So this is the pre part. So grab the mission then attach your learning objectives to them and attach it to the game. So naturally it flows into what you are doing is just supporting the mission of the institution. You are creating space for students to engage with their cohort, to connect to their community, to connect to librarians, to connect to the resources as well as the space of the library. And then you roll into there. So mission's always a great place to start. Numbers are also fantastic. So if you're doing your learning objective, do your assessment as well. So we are assess we assess that we met those objectives. We have 30 students, 40 students. We're getting students from this particular group that we never got before. All those kinds of things. Numbers are fantastic as well. Awesome suggestions. Um, is participation just for the thrill of the game or do you offer prizes? Ooh. I do offer prizes as well. It, and this is kind of one of those balancing things because I don't always want to have a prize, but um, if I want my assessments to be uh, fulfilled, then I will offer a prize because a lot of times they don't want to fill out a survey. Having the smallest prize will get them to fill out a survey every time, even if it's just a t-shirt or just a pizza box, you know, that kind of thing is good. But for the most part, I think the students really enjoy um, connecting with each other and being in space with each other. I actually do not do prices in an instruction setting. In outreach, I do. Oh. Um, 
I usually rely on like a sense of competition and bragging rights, which I also know is controversial. A lot of uh, librarians who don't use games when they have to teach one of my lesson plans, that can be a thing that like they are really hesitant to pit students against each other in the classroom. Um, I've never had a problem with it, but that is a good thing to keep in mind if you're designing lesson plans that other people might be teaching is the energy that the instructor brings definitely shapes the game, uh, not necessarily in a positive or a negative way, but when you're having a game just like any other lesson plan, um, it's up for interpretation from the facilitator. Uh, and just as an aside, somebody had asked about Padlet. I'm adding another section about cool games you already do. That way you can share your cool things and other people can ask follow-up questions. Oh, and the follow-up with that, I was talking mostly about um, outreach rather than instruction and agree with you on that, Amber. We just had one other question that came in towards the end of the presentation. Um, how did you create the personas? Oh, my wife made them for me. <laughs> so she likes drawing. And so I asked, I just asked for them. I was like, I would like one of me and one of Amber, please. Thank you. Yeah, Jesse's great. They are so fun. Well, I'll go ahead and turn around to, is there any other questions that can be popped into the chat while we're reaching towards the end of our time? If mm -hmm. not, Feel free to continue submitting them. If we can't get to them, we can always follow up with our presenters here too. Absolutely. Like I tell my students, this is the thing I love talking about yeah. most in the entire world. So feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to connect. We can set up Zooms. We can set up larger conversations with both Amber and I. Mm -hmm. or we can talk in the Padlet. And 100%, I am serious about the community of practice. I want to talk more about this forever. Thank you both again so much. Um, and as we're wrapping up, we'll pause one more time if anyone has uh, one or two more questions. Um, but before that, just wanted to thank Amber and Danielle. Virtual round of applause to you both. Um, Colleen and Alicia for being here for the Professional Development Committee. And then Brian and Alois Sharp from ACRL to be here to do the behind the scenes magic. Um, we have a brief about session evaluation form, and I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. We would love to hear your thoughts and to see you at future presentations. And um, with that, pause one more time for questions. We'll share the slides once more, and you all will get a recording after this session um, ends um, as well. And thanks again. Oh, absolutely. And Thank you all for taking care week. of us. I see one last minute question came in. I just want to bring, are y'all okay if I share the interest form with someone I met at Yalsa? Absolutely. Share awesome. everything in all of the places. All of it's meant to be shared. And I know I shook my head. It should be this way. Yes, <laughs> yes, share widely. I'm like trying to run through chat. I see some people are going to mm -hmm. be at CCLI. Please come up and say hello. 100%. You will see me annual with another one of my nonsense shirts. I'm very easy to find. If you see me in the wild, please say hi. I love it. It's not whoever made the RPG on evaluating sources shared it on the Padlet. So I'm excited to just yes. out. The smartest idea we ever came up with was like, wait, we should have them talk to us too. Mm -hmm. I am um, not seeing anything else in the chat and I see people starting to leave. So I think Solid. we can officially end the recording. Um, let me go ahead and stop recording. <laughs>